Hi folks, uh, this is just an update on how I do, what I do, and why I do, and while I feel it's important. My filmmaking career has changed somewhat since I first started, where I now develop very intimate relationships with the animals I film. But where did this all start? So I was fortunate enough to grow up in the Kruger National Park in South Africa, where my father, Henry Walleter, was the the head ranger. And my grandfather, Harry Walleter, was the very first game ranger of Kruger and, and somewhat a local legend. Some of you will know the story of how this lion pulled him from his horse and was dragging him off to go and eat him and he managed to kill it with a knife. And Harry went on to work 44 years in the Kruger National Park. And when he retired, my father took over his position. Now this is my dad at 13 years old with the first lion that he shot. This is the only picture I have of my dad in his school uniform. Now you've got to realize school in those days was a good hour, I mean a good day's drive from the bush. And so was this on his way to school or was this on his way back from school? Or, or did you, this just what you did when you shot your first lion, you posed in your school uniform? Anyway, then I came along as the youngest game ranger to take up this position, even though the rifle was taller than me. I eventually outgrew the rifle, although not by very much. And now armed with a BSc degree in, in grassland science, I managed a reserve, a private reserve in Tule Block in Botswana, before becoming warden of a reserve in Eswatini. But I found this carrying a rifle around a bit much, so I opted for a much easier lifestyle, and I became a wildlife filmmaker. Now in the last 35 years, I've spent more time sleeping on this on my camera box than I have in a bed and you know they always say to be a filmmaker you have to have a lot of patience well if this is what they call patience then I've got plenty of it you know in my grandfather's day life was very much out in the field most of the time and and travel was on horseback and he was part of nature every day and when my father took over, slowly his work was now becoming more office orientated, having to deal with writing reports, meetings, dealing with staff and all that stuff. And he was getting around in a, in a vehicle. Now as a wildlife filmmaker, I'm now able to be very much out in the field again and being a part of the natural world. And I believe in the wildlife profession as a filmmaker, I probably spend more time in the field than anybody else. And that's why I do it. Now if we look at the wildlife filming industry that started in the mid-1950s, the way I see it, it's gone through three different eras. You know, that first era, the mid-1950s to 1980, just when television sets were becoming everyday household appliances, audiences were in awe just seeing animals, seeing wildlife that inhabited our planet. Wildlife they might have heard of before, but never seen. The next era, the 1980s to 2000, having seen all the animals, this era was now more about animal behavior, and we were making stories that grip the audience based on animal behavior. Like the last era, animals were filmed over there. You know, there was a complete disconnect between filmmaker and the natural world. We filmed, you know, we filmed from our vehicles with huge lenses, and everything was, was far away. There was no engagement with the natural world. And even the audience could feel that disconnect. Now the third era was 2000 until now. In this era where wildlife films now often have presenters. So slowly we're beginning to engage with Mother Nature again. I started my career in the second era where films were made from the safety of our vehicles. This era which really educated and enlightened us about wildlife. And people were often in awe just seeing predators killing for a living. And, and I think many people came to Africa on safari hoping to see just that. And our, our stories were now full of drama. You know, drama that was totally over-dramatized, especially by the Americans. You know, I was doing a film for National Geographic called A Dog's Life. And all around the world, the film was called A Dog's Life, except in America and America only. They changed the title. To killer dogs of Africa. And this drama is great to grab people's attention and I, I suppose to entertain them and of course 
for the broadcasters this is great for ratings. But although fascinated and captivated by all this drama, this has subconsciously created a fear in people because they're now fully aware of what these animals are about and capable of. And this is all fine when you're sitting in the comfort of your armchair. Now having massively over-dramatized this wild world, we, we, you know, we just cannot imagine ourselves setting foot in the wilds of Africa for fear of being bitten by a snake, trampled by an elephant, or eaten by something. And we even have guides telling guests when they get in the safari vehicle that if you step out the car, you will die. And, you know, this is so not true. And, but because of all this hype, we're becoming more and more distanced from the natural world, and it's becoming more foreign and, and scary for us. And us filming with our big lenses from far away, the audience just doesn't feel any sense of connection. And presenters are often telling us, you know, what a dangerous situation they're in. Like, any minute now, this animal could eat me. And, you know, why? So why would anybody want to protect anything that scares them? Now, a typical BBC one-hour documentary will be shot over two years, shooting for about seven months in that two-year period. They go and they shoot a month here and a month there. And they go out there with a specific story in mind, and they shoot according to that story. Now, I like to spend the whole two years in the field because I want to be out there, even though it, <laughs> it doesn't make economic sense. But being in the field for that two years, the whole two years, and documenting everything, there is a story, a very natural story, and that's the story I like to tell. Now, having been making films for nearly 20 years, my transition from the second era to the third era was, was really by chance. I was making a film on hyenas for National Geographic called Hyena Queen. And I was out the vehicle one day filming and this hyena approached and normally I would have got back in the vehicle but for some reason this day I didn't. And the hyena approached and I held out my hand not knowing whether she was going to sniff it, lick it, bite it. And to my utter surprise she didn't do any of that. She, she put her chin on my hand as if inviting contact. And so then I thought, well, what if I scratch you? Are you going to bite me? So gingerly I started scratching her on her neck and she lifted her neck up. Oh, yes, I love that. Oh, oh, that's the best. <laughs> and from that day on, whenever I was out the vehicle, she would come for scratches. And of course, my daughter named her Scratchy. Now, if it wasn't for Scratchy, I wouldn't be doing what I do today. She changed the way I approach filmmaking and she added a whole new meaning <clears throat> to being a part of nature and to really understanding hyenas. And this for me was Mother Nature just showing me that we can be a part of this world in the most natural way. Now, having been granted this access, I was now able to film low angle on the ground with a wide angle lens and getting in amongst the animals when they were playing, killing, doing whatever they were doing and being totally unconcerned about my presence. And the audience, I believe, now get to feel like they really are right in there and they're almost feeling that connection. Now I was, I was doing a cheetah film for the Discovery Channel called Man Cheetah Wild and on seeing some of the footage Discovery got back to me and said no Kim you, you've got to up the ante this is all looking far too easy and for me that was the greatest compliment they could have paid me because it meant what I was doing was was totally natural. And so I carried on in my normal, natural way. Now these interactions with wild animals, with cheetah, hyenas, leopard, wild dogs, would never have happened if it wasn't for that initial interaction with the hyena scratchy. But now how has all of this been possible? So I work with three very simple basic rules. Rule number one, I never feed them. You know, when you feed an animal, this causes all sorts of complications. Remember, food is their survival. And you interfere with that, and then you're seen as competition. The second rule is, I never carry a weapon. You know, when you carry a weapon, you're, you're arrogant and your body language is, is aggressive. And the animals can sense that, and you'll never develop a relationship with them. And also, what right do I have to shoot an animal because I've intruded in its space and they, they retaliate? I believe in working with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis where we both respect each other. 
And then the third rule is they make the rules. That is, it's up to them to decide if they want to engage with me. And with these three very simple rules, the natural world is very willing to accept us back. The other really important thing is when I get out the vehicle, I do so with the utmost of confidence. Not an arrogance, confidence. And it's important that this confidence comes from the heart. You know, you can say to yourself, oh, I'm going to be fine. But if it doesn't come from the heart, they're going to sense that. So when interacting with any animal, one must not only have confidence, but respect and trust play a huge part too. And if you trust them, they'll trust you. But you can't expect them to trust you if you don't reciprocate. And I know that's often hard to do. Another thing that makes a lot of this possible is the fact that I'm seldom looking directly at the animal. I'm not making eye contact. It's, you know, it's almost as if I'm not interested in them because I'm always looking through the eyepiece of a camera. And, you know, eye contact is a really big thing. It's our eyes, I believe, are like LED screens to our brains. And we read everything from them. I also wonder sometimes if me being a male in a female-dominant society has helped me developing these relationships. You know, if we think about Jane Goodall with you know, work with chimpanzees and Diane Fossey's work with gorillas, these ladies were working in a male-dominant society, so they weren't seen as a threat. And so the same with me and the hyenas not being seen as a threat in this female-dominant society. Now, my career has changed somewhat. Yes, I'm still making films, but the way I approach them is different. I really want to engage with the natural world. And I know what I do is at times seem to be controversial. But I believe this is only because people are still trying to come to terms with the way, with how we fit and how we used to fit into this natural world. Now, I've gone on to work with hyenas in four different areas, and in each place, I've developed intimate relationships with individuals in each clan. So this wasn't just a one-off encounter with one specific hyena. I've now had very intimate relationships with around 20 hyenas from four different areas. And, you know, as soon as we engage with hyenas, as I have, we start to discover something about hyenas that nobody ever thought imaginable. He has an animal that actually seeks out our affection. Remember, there's no food involved, not like your dog or cat at home that you have to feed. So the relationship is incredibly special. So much so that I often wonder, why were hyenas never domesticated? Like our domestic dogs that evolved from wolves. And people who have raised hyenas find them to make amazing pets. So from what I've experienced, hyenas show an incredible desire to be with me, to seek my attention. And this was not just one hyena. So why weren't hyenas domesticated? The truth is this is never going to happen in Africa. I believe it's to do with witchcraft and superstition that is so strong in the African cultures that there's no way and still no way people would even think of it. Except, except in Ethiopia, where they've learned to live with hyenas. And in the city Addis Ababa, there's a higher density of hyenas than anywhere else in Africa. So I'm just hoping that my approach to filmmaking, where I engage with wildlife I'm filming, in a very natural way, and of course always sticking to those three rules, will help us to understand the natural world in a way we never thought imaginable, only because we've become so removed from it and it's so foreign to us. And I hope I can get people to appreciate and understand not just hyenas, but allow nature to engage with us. We must realize we are not something separate from nature. We are all a part of it. So I want people to protect our natural world, not just for future generations, but for ourselves too, because we innately require it to replenish our souls. And maybe this next era of wildlife filmmaking will be just that. Wouldn't it be nice if the next era of filmmaking was this? But the reality is, I think the next era of filmmaking is going to be controlled by artificial intelligence and that's going to mean we're just going to become even more disconnected from this natural world scary thank you